A very warm welcome from Scotland, Mr. Dan Pena. Welcome, Dan. We've collected lots of questions from the audience. To start with, go back in time. You're 72 now? I'm 72. Let's go back in time, when you were young. What were your dreams? Well, when I was uh, in gra grade school, I didn't have any dreams. Uh, the only goal my father had for me was to keep me alive. Alive, uh, not dead, till I reached the age of reason. He didn't know if that was 20, 30, 40, or ever. Uh, and I didn't really uh, establish goals other than staying alive because I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, when I was in the uh, grammar school, I tried to kill my teacher, amongst other things. I got expelled, not from the school, but from the district. They wouldn't allow me to go to school in the district. Uh, and I've been arrested and in jail five, six times. Uh, and, uh, but then I went into the military, and uh, that straightened me out and made a man of me. But your father was a policeman. My dad was a high-profile policeman, hard, 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 tough guy, tough guy. What, and, uh, what, what his, did you learn his, from him? Uh, well, I learned that um, discipline, focus, honesty. The basic rules. Yep. So there were no dreams when you were young. Mm -mm. So what did you do after school? Got in trouble. Mm-hmm. Like we all do? Yeah, got in trouble. Um, how did you did, get out? I did, did awful things, um, got in fights, beat up people, hurt people. I was very good at that. Yeah. I was, in that sense, I was a high performer. I could really kick the it, shit out of people pretty a, well. You were a fighter. <laughs> yeah, correct. So how did you end up in Wall Street? Uh, by the grace of God, I lived. I uh, went off to the military, entered a private came out four years later, an officer, and I was getting a big award in the military, and there was a two-star general that was uh, pinning something on my chest, and he said, you know, if you were in the real world, Danny, that's what they used to call me, I was a lieutenant, you could probably get rich. And a light bulb went off over my head. I had never thought of that before. I didn't know how much a million dollars was, except for about that same time frame, one of the other young officers inherited $1.4 million, and he was buying all the officers' drinks in the officers' club. And I said, well, why is John buying us all drinks? He says, he just inherited a million dollars. And I said, write it down for me. I'm 22 years old. And he put it with the zeros. I go, fuck. I didn't know how many zeros a million had. And then the general said that if you went out in the real world, Dan, you could probably make a lot of money. I then, within a week, I took action. I reversed my paperwork. I just put in paperwork to be a permanent military forever, and I reversed it to get out, and I got out five, six months later. I came back, uh, went back to school, uh, where I had to get special permission because I had flunked out three times out of university, and then I graduated ultimately with honors, and uh, I wanted to go where the action was, and the action in those days, and this was in 1972, was uh, on Wall Street. So I went to work for a Wall Street firm, and I was really good at it. One, I was a good salesman. Uh, two, I had learned to be articulate, and I had already self-confidence uh, and self-esteem, and so uh, those are a great combination for an investment banker in the early 70s. What is self-esteem? Self-esteem is um, what most of your parents didn't give you. It's a, it's, it's a form of self-confidence. It's a form of self-awareness. But uh, the most important thing, in my judgment, uh, that we are put on the earth is to procreate, so homo sapien continues, right? Well, it's the least informed thing that our parents know anything about. And when I get parents and they say, um, I did, you know, I didn't know any better. You, you don't know what you don't know. I did what my parents did to me. Did is the operative word. I did what my parents did to me. Now, what kind of teaching structure is that? Uh, most parents aren't um, capable of, uh, of creating high-performance kids, unless you're Andrew Agassi and Steffi Graf. I mean, that, those kids are going to be high performance in one way or another because they're both world champions. But, but ask yourself about your parents. I already know the answer. And so self-esteem is the bedrock 
of high performance. It's the bedrock of everything. And it's the least thing that is taught in schools. So what can you do to build self-confidence and self-esteem? You are who you hang around with. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. The first self-esteem is built the first seven or eight years of life. Who are you around the first seven or eight years of life? Mom, maybe dad, older brother, uncle, a grandmother, right? What the hell do they know about building self-esteem? They don't know anything. And now, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Who do you go hang with? Who do you chill with? And, I, and, I, and he, he and I, we disagree about a few things, but Bill Gates doesn't hang. Steve Jobs, who I knew, didn't chill. Um, uh, Warren Buffett doesn't hang. Elon Musk doesn't hang. And I go down the list of people that don't hang. Yet, I was just, we were uh, this morning having coffee, uh, my wife in Vinica, my longtime uh, business associate, in, in the sun there on the canal. And I said, this is what I remember about the Netherlands. Not doing anything. <laughs> now, I gave a speech in 1997-ish at the De Amstel Club. I was a member, and uh, Mr. Heineken was my sponsor, who I'm sure you know that name. And um, I, I used to give a speech in Holland called, Holland is not heaven. Now, that went over like a poop in a punch bowl. Um, nobody liked that speech. So I'm in the damsel club making the speech, and uh, Mr. Heineken stood up and said, Mr. Pena, with the greatest respect, can you talk about something else? We know that the end, is, you know, the, the great surge in property prices, the burst, uh, you know, et cetera, is going to end, but we don't want to think about it. And uh, so I talked about something else. But in those days, in the late 90s, for those of you that are old enough to remember, this, you couldn't get any better climate for investment, for property. I mean, great food, great this, the canals, the sun, oh my God, it was terrific. And so a lot of people used to call it, Holland is heaven. And of course it isn't. Um, so the people that you're now associating with, would you want your children to be like your two best buddies or two best gal friends, whatever you call it? Uh, would you? Probably not. Would you even want your children to be like you? Probably not. So why, why, why is there so little being done about it? Why is there so little being done about it? Michael is one of my success stories, but I have a lot of them. But I mean, the, um, when he came to me, uh, I used to call him the Dutch movie star. I know. Yeah. And uh, the story about one uh, two-man seminar for him and his good buddy, uh, was true, because he didn't have time for scheduling. I forget what it was. But whatever it was, we accommodated him. And uh, the, uh, but very few people are happy with what they're doing. And if you want to build self-esteem, deal with people that have high self-esteem. Now, it's not likely Elon Musk is going to have coffee with you. Maybe. It's not likely that Warren Buffett's going to have coffee with you. So how do you do that? Well, how do you, you, how do you get well, to the Well, I'm, gonna, I'm about to tell you. The um, rotary... Um, uh, Toastmasters, you only have one time to make a first impression. The first impression is how you look. Now, I already know how I look, and you know how I look as well. Second impression is when you open your mouth. Most of you, with the greatest respect, uh, can't speak properly. You stutter, you mumble, you sweat, and I can go on and on, and I'm describing most of the people in this room. He's an anomaly to that. He was born for the stage, more or less. See, he basks. He likes these hot lights on him. Uh, most of us don't. I've learned to like the hot lights because I want to convey my message. So you go where there are people that you want to be like. You find somebody that is, and my whole basis is mentorship, find somebody that is where you want to be 20 or 30 years from now and go to him or her now uh, and... Um, I had the, the, the presence of mind to be attracted to some very, very famous, very, very well, wealthy people in my 50-year career. And I went after them, to uh, not, not for money, not for anything like that, but I just wanted them to talk to me and to share their wisdom. And, uh, the, and today, people are afraid. We've had mentees in the last couple of years that actually got through to Bill Gates on the phone and on the email. His email used to be info at Microsoft. Or info at Microsoft Gates. I mean, pretty simple. 
and, and, but you can't stop trying. If you wanted to be a world-class athlete, where would you go? A world-class coach, right? No, no question about it. If you, if you want to be uh, a world-class anything, when I was watching the, uh, the, both the Winter and the Summer Olympics, and, and when, when it comes to hockey, and it comes to uh, down sled and all uh, uh, the Winter Olympics, the Netherlands are at the forefront. Well, they're not coaching with somebody like me that doesn't know anything about that. They're being coached by somebody that has won gold medals. When was the last time that you've been at a table for, and now coffee's not popular, now it's a bottled water, uh, with a, a world-class anything? Uh, you know, I'm not being, uh, blowing smoke at my own ass, but I may be the only world-class person you've ever heard talk in person. That's sad if that's true. Because there's a lot of us out there. So what's your advice? What should they do? My advice is, this: Michael is a stepping stone, as he would tell you himself. There are a lot of people out there. All my stuff is free. All my stuff is free on the website. It has been for many, many, many years. I don't sell fuck all. Why do I give it away, Dan? Oh, Dan, why do I give it away? I give it away to get the last excuse from you 20, 30 years from now. Well, I didn't know how. Nobody ever showed me, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why Michael asked me to speak here. I'm, I'm speaking here for free. I just, you know, it's, it's not any great secret. Uh, the, uh, because I want to pass the message out as many times as, to as many as possible. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary of QLA, my high-performance coaching. We have crea created $650 billion with meatheads just like you. They call me the $50 billion man because $50 billion, I can make one phone call, I can prove it in court. One guy, $56 billion. It, sounds, it actually sounds better than the $673 billion man. But someday when I hit a trillion, which I will, we're changing all our stationery, all our crap, to the $1 trillion man. Uh, the, um, but that's where you start. And uh, I'll ask you a question. There are tons of great people, motivating, uh, motivational people out there. There are. That's not what I do. He, he, he described it very well. You know, uh, I didn't know he was out of money when he came to me right then. I found out after the fact. Uh, but you come to me when you've tried everything else known to man. I am the last saloon on the last street of the last town before when the world used to be flat. After me, there is nothing except the abyss. You don't come to me, I mean, unless, because I give you a fucking beating. I am hard. Olympic athletes say, you're as hard as my Olympic coach was when I won two gold medals. That's the kind of person you want in your life. Not somebody that agrees with you. Not somebody that says, it's all right, you can try again. You're only 26. You've got the rest of your life. That's crap. Now look at all these people in there. 30, 40s, somebody told them that bullshit 25 years ago. Now look at them. Just look, look around the goddamn table you're sitting with. And I don't even have my glasses on. I see bald heads, gray hair. Jesus Christ, don't you have anything better to do than come to a goddamn thing like this on a Friday? You can find the people. LinkedIn is the best sales tool social media marketing for finding high-performance people that was ever invented. LinkedIn. Some of you, I can tell some of the people don't even know what I'm talking about. Where'd you get these guys? Jesus. Dutchies. Yeah, oh, oh, God. They're slow, you know. Uh, I was in the sun just sitting back. Oh, God, just imagine if I had been Dutch. But this isn't the real world. And that's why I told uh, at the Damsel Club, uh, Holland is in heaven. You realize that, don't you? Holland is not heaven. It just isn't. So I where, wish it was. Where is heaven? I don't know. I haven't found it yet. Guthrie Castle is as close to heaven as I know, and I live there. Um, the, uh, but from a guy, I was a barrio bad boy in the barrio of East Los Angeles to the Guthrie. That's a big leap. That's a big, big... It doesn't... I can't imagine... Well, came close last year. I was uh, honored by the Queen of England. I am now, as they call, 
a member of St. John. A member of St. John, which is just below. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, it, it, it's a derivative of the Templar, the people that supposedly took Christ's body, da-da-da, and, you know, the Knights of the Templar. That's what it's a derivative of. But for a kid in East L.A. who almost killed his teacher. Now, was I thinking about killing the teacher? No. I was up on the, you'd call it the second floor with an aquarium, and I looked down at the teacher, and the teacher had pissed me off. And back in those days, I wasn't the kind of guy you'd want to piss off. So I dropped the aquarium. It weighed 45 pounds. By the grace of God, Allah, Buddha, he moved. And it didn't hit him in the head. It hit him in the shoulder and crushed his shoulder, right? Clavicle. If that had killed him back in the mid-50s, I wouldn't be sitting here. I, the queen wouldn't have given me anything, not even a postage stamp. And I wouldn't be living in a castle because I would have spent the, part of, a majority of my adult life in prison. But he lived. By some... How did your father respond? He beat me to within an inch of my life. Did you ever beat him back? I never... Oh, I would never even think of hitting my dad. My dad had a 56-inch chest, a 28-inch waist, and 18-inch biceps, and he ne never lifted weights. For you six-packers out there, never lifted weights. He was an uh, all-American gymnast. In high school, I would, oh, I, just, I get chills even thinking about hitting him. I mean, he would have killed me. But he beat me, and every beating I got from my dad, I deserved 20 more. Because he only beat me for what he, I got caught. If the nuns caught me, they beat me. If the priest caught me, they beat me. And then my dad would come back into town, and he beat me because they didn't beat me enough. And my wife was sitting out there. You know, who's met my dad. When she met my dad, he's just a nice little old man, 90 years old. He's, he's gone to his maker. I'm not saying he went to heaven. He's gone to his maker. He's, he's gone to some place. Uh, but uh, he, he believed an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He taught me not to turn the other cheek. How fast can you see whether a person mentee will make it or not when they come to the castle? How fast can you judge? Five minutes. There you know. I smell death in this room. Fear. Exactly. I'm an old man. If I, if I can get fear out of you, I'm 72 years old. I'm at least 40 years past my prime. But I guarantee you, if, unless there's Bruce Lee out there, I can kick the shit out of anybody in this room. Unless you got a knife and know how to use it, you're going to get fucked up by me if we got physical altercation. I'm 72. I don't act 72. I don't sound 72. And I sure shit don't look 72. I have the blood labs of a 30-year-old. So what can we do to save ourselves and to save the best of the best? Find the five or six guys or one guy that's on the Internet that, that is not telling you bullshit. Uh, and there are a few, not many. Um, and, but most of you are following three, five, seven, ten, twelve people. You read seven, twelve, fifteen books. Uh, and when I was, was privileged enough to speak at Oxford a couple of years ago, uh, the, uh, one of the kids who was in the front row, I still remember, he's 19 years old, he says, I've read 700 books on personal development. And I said, with the greatest respect, I didn't know there was 700 books. And um, somebody else in the audience said, who would you rather have in your financial foxhole, in your financial battle, in your financial war? Somebody that's read 700 books or done 700 deals? Well, I'm not, well I stopped counting at 1,000 deals. Uh, and uh, who would you rather have? And most of the people that you're listening to are talking rubbish. As my wife would say, rubbish. And, but you don't know any different. You don't know any different. What are the, the common mistakes entrepreneurs make when they start doing business, when they're getting successful? What do they do wrong? They, they don't focus on the few. They focus on the many. Focus on the few. Let me give you an example. A number of you have started a business at one time in, in your life. The first 50,000 or 100,000 euros in your revenue, when you start, 
is geometric growth. So everybody that has ever started a business that generated any income, that's geometric growth because it's starting from ground zero to the first 50, 100. Everybody with me? Okay. What happens? You stop playing to win and you start playing not to lose. If when, not if, but when you decide that you really want to invoke permanent change, you start playing to win all the time. And nobody preaches that. They say, keep six months of reserve in your uh, uh, bank account, right? In case you lose your job. That's a, that's a common bullshit. For the first 30 years of my life, I, I spent 125% of every penny that I made every year. I was always, as you would say, in debt instead of debt. I don't know why I call it debt, but any in debt. Why? Because I didn't want any backup. I didn't want any plan B. I either succeeded or died financially. I stopped that when I turned 60. As my lovely wife, who's a chartered accountant, international tax expert, coincidentally, <coughs> we started getting rid of our assets and turning to cash, except for the castle. So we're all in cash. So I don't spend 125% of what I made since I'm 60. But for, from the time I was 20 to the time I was 60, I did, which is just the opposite of what the, the people teach you. It's rubbish. It just is. You're, for the most part, you're listening to people they know how to make, want to make you feel good for three, four, five, ten weeks and then come back and they got an upsell or an upsell and a side sell and a this sell and a that sell. And uh, all my stuff's free. I've got from teenage multimillionaires, 17, on my side to the biggest transaction in the history of the world, $500 billion last year by one of my mentees. $500 billion with a B. Neom. What did he do? He convinced the Saudi government and the uh, Jordanian government and the Egyptian government, mostly Saudi, to put up $500 billion to build the new city of the future called Neom. It's, it's, all, it's all online. And he's the CEO, Dr. Klaus Kleinfeld. I've been, I've been his mentor since uh, 1997. Uh, and uh, so I've got from teenage multimillionaires to the biggest deal on the planet, everything I'm in between. I've got no education, I mean literally no education, to multiple PhDs, Oxford scholars, etc. And there's no, there's no rhyme or reason, there's no real rationale why a PhD from Oxford to a guy that uh, got out of the third grade, out of school when he was eight or nine years old, there's none except desire, sacrifice, that's it. And I taught at Nairobi. Anybody uh, take my... When I was teaching at Nairobi in the 90s, nobody. Okay, so we've got thick shits here, a bunch of dumb shits. Well, I taught at Nairobi. I taught uh, uh, Erasmus um, the, um, in the 90s. And uh, the, the, in the 90s, the kids really were looking towards the future. Now I go back and I, I, I go to school, and now they just want to chill and play video games. It's a, it's a different thing. You see a difference? Oh, God, yes. Hell, yes. The kids are just unbelievable. The, ch the change? Oh, absolutely. And I started to see the change in 2004, 5, 6, 7 in that area, era. And, um, but the last 10 years, my demographics have gone, it used to be in the 90s and early 2000s, it was 35 to 55 followed me. The last seven or eight years, it's 15 to 35. 15. 15, 1, 5. And... The, the, the reason is the kids can figure out bullshit now. They just Google or Wikipedia, which isn't the greatest source. They Wikipedia something. And they say, well, that's, that's rubbish. Now, when we were being raised, we knew our parents told us crap. We listened out of politeness, most of us, myself included, out of fear in my case. But now kids, your dad, uh, a dad will tell his son or a daughter, and they'll just say, that's rubbish. Dad's talking shit. Why is he telling us that? And so now the kids, younger and younger, are coming to me because they can make money on the Internet. And now, uh, when, when I was 17, I, I was just, you know, I was playing with my, my, my own body parts when I was 17. I wasn't trying to make 20 grand a month on the internet. But now the kids are pretty smart. Hey, they're actually smarter than the adults. They're smarter than the adults. And what age were you when you started Great Western, your first company? Uh, 1982, I was 36. You started at 36? 36. Why did you start? Uh, I got thrown out of uh, the company. I was an investment banker, went to work for one of our corporate clients. Then I got thrown out. 
Uh, not dissimilar, remember I told you you'd get thrown out. Of course, when I told him, when he was young, oh no, Dan, that doesn't happen to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what did I do wrong? Well, you, you, sh you should have known they were gonna throw you out because I, you should have planned better. You can preclude yourself of getting thrown out, not to the very end, but you can walk away with more money, honest money, if you know that someday your board or your other shareholders are gonna roll on you or, or stab you in the back. So you plan, so when you put your shareholders agreements, and this is all on the website too, you put your shareholders agreement together, and the various agreements, you put a push-pull agreement, meaning if I get thrown out, you and I have already agreed on a formula how we're gonna value the company. Um, but uh, the thing that he paid the closest attention to is how to get the money <laughs> from the banks and selling smoke. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, good story. Yeah, good story. Selling, he, he excelled at that. He didn't pay too close attention to the other stuff. But uh, he did well. I mean, you know, and he's arguably on your third career, maybe fourth, depending on when you want to count. But guys and gals, with the greatest respect, the, the people, and when you go home tonight, for those of you that aren't here with your significant others, you're going to hear the same rubbish, the same old shite, as my wife would say, Scottish for shit. It's tough. It's tough. W w when did you start QLA? Uh, How did you come up well, with no, that when idea? I got, when I got thrown out of Great Western um, in uh, January 92. Um, uh, so you had your company? I had a lot they of money. They kicked you out. Oh, yeah, they kicked me out. I had a lot of money, you know, a lot of, a pre, except for internet money. I had a lot of money. I created a half a billion dollars in 1982, or 1992, and then I thought I was going to teach, so I tried to teach university for a year, and that was very unfulfilling. And so then one of my very bright friends said, Dan, why don't you coach? Uh, and he says, there's a lot of personal development guys out there, but there's no high-performance wealth coaches. This is 92, and there still aren't any high-performance wealth coaches that can prove to you they have a track record. Uh, and that's what I did. I started in, in uh, first seminar I gave was May of 1993 in Los Angeles. And, uh, but since this century, since 2000, I, I've only been giving the Castle Seminar, uh, and I gave all the product away. 99.999% of all the millionaires, billionaires that I've made, I have not met. They have not sat in a room like this listening to me speak. I would know them if I get, you know, I get emails all the time, thank you, I made $82 million, I just sold my business, I bought your book in 2009, and, but I wouldn't know them, that's fine. I want them, I want them to uh, have a better life. But if you're not willing to make sacrifice and change, um, the, um, and we have, we have Dutch guys that have been successful, we don't have any Dutch, oh, and gals, uh, Dutch guys and gals, mostly guys, not gals, uh, and um, QLAs for boys and girls. Boys and girls, yeah. It's, it, it, and for everybody in between. Uh, we had a, a seminar last week, a very uh, attractive young girl from Los Angeles, and she's, uh, I, I, I would have called her gay. She's a lesbian. I said, fine. We're and she says, um, and she told me, well, you know, her life story, as they do. And she says, uh, but I'm, I'm bisexual too. And so I said, well, I'll make a note of that so I remember your biceps or two. Uh, yeah, everybody in between. We don't care. But if your dress, how you look, disrupts the castle seminar, you can't dress that way. That's where I draw the line. So if, they, if they're dressed. What's the dress code? Oh, the dress code is suit for men and business attire for women. Every day from 8 in the morning till midnight. 8 in the morning till midnight. But um, the, uh, so if you're gonna come wearing, well, you know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry that you're stopped at the gate by security and said thank you very much. Because you have to send a picture to be approved and a bunch of other stuff. But they send me a picture when they were in high school. Not when they have uh, rings in their nipples and shit when they show up, you know. Those people, uh, we draw the line there and they're, they're not. Even if you recommend them, we don't let them in. I got a question. Okay. Because people tell, uh, you have a lot of success stories. But Correct. There are people who not succeed. Mentees. Oh, absolutely. Well, what's the average? A hundred percent of the people that follow the seven steps succeed. 
They may only make 100,000 euros or 100 million. The people, 40% of the people drop out because they can't follow the steps. 40%. So what do they do wrong? They do wrong. Common uh, mistakes. Uh, well, most of them, and you know a couple of the guys, they go from the castle to the bank and they take the money, except they're robbing the bank without a mask and without a gun. That's how easy it is to get money today. It's the lowest interest rates in 5,000 years. The lowest interest rates. By the way, what are you going to tell your grandchildren and your uh, children 20 years from now when the greatest transformation of wealth occurred? What were you doing, Grandpa? What were you doing, Dad? Would you have your thumb up your ass? What are you going to tell them? You had your thumb up your ass. It, was, it may have been covered with uh, old Geneva or new Geneva, but you had your thumb up your ass. Okay, so they go to the banks, and we show you how to get money from the bank in a legal way, just as you did. Just as the other couple of Dutch guys you and I both know. But then you don't do good things with it. I just had one of my superstars uh, arrested two days, two, three, four, four days ago for presumably taking $125 million in, in a bad way. That's a lot of money, $125 million. But we show you how to do it, legally. Absolute, 100% if you follow the steps. But you can just kind of vary a little and not follow the steps, and you can, you know. And you slide. Correct. All the way. Correct. But 125 million, I saw a, a few eyebrows. That's his one kid, he's 28 years old. 125 million dollars. What were you fucking doing at 28 years old? Other so, than having your Geneva cover thumb up your ass. What's their secret? Why can they do it? They, because they, they want change. Not everybody that comes to seminars, Michael, wants change. It's like when I was growing up, Uh, sm uh, smoking dope and doing heroin and well, I mean not you in the 60s was what you did where I come from That's it because everybody else did it. So you did it Well now everybody well, you know It's like sitting in the hall and all oh, the sun is great. Can I have another cappuccino, please? Uh, well, you come to seminars you're filling up the day Most most people we've had people that I've met That, by the way, that 700 book kid came to this council seminar, and he's about to close his first deal. He might have been today or yesterday. He's 19 years old. He's 20 now. 20 years old. 20 years old. But they, they really want to evoke change. They, you know, look in the mirror. Most of you, don't, you know, don't like what you, they see. Not just because you, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're bald, you're gray, whatever. It's because you know what you could have been. Uh, we're in the regret minimization business. When I was your age, I said, well, by the time I'm 80, I, 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 want these, I don't want these regrets. And now I'm 72. Shit, I should have said by the time I'm 90 because age you know, uh, creeps up on you. And people ask me, are you happy? I said, yes. I've only got three regrets in my life, three. One, I'm a combat-trained army officer who never saw combat. That's just the way it was during the Vietnam War. Two, I yelled at my mother the day before she died. I said, Mom, Mom, you're not sick. God damn it, you're not going to fucking die. Next morning, she's dead. And three, I didn't set my goals high enough. Not because I missed my son's soccer ball. Not because I missed my daughter's prom. That's all rubbish. That's not what you say when you're about to die. And you whisper in your wife's ear or your son's ear or whoever's going to give the eulogy, I regret the things I didn't do. I coulda, I woulda, I shoulda. Uh, maybe I shouldn't allow you to have too many cappuccinos in the sun too long, you know, uh, on the canal. I really, no, I, I did it for two hours today. I won't do it again for 25 years. Although I could do it every single day. I'm just like you, I'm human. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't be drinking cappuccinos. I'd be drinking old Geneva, a day, nah, nah, nah. chased with Heineken. How's your perfect life balance? Well, I don't have a perfect life. There, are, Jack Welch, arguably the greatest CEO in the history of the world, who managed in um, General Electric for 20, 25 years, he said there is no work-life uh, uh, balance. There are work-life work uh, challenges. And we make decisions and we live with them. Do you think Elon Musk has work-life balance? No. Do you think Steve Jobs, when he was alive, had work-life balance? No. Do you think Bill Gates? No. Henry Ford? No. Original Heineken? No. 
So if none of those people that created the wealth of the world had work-life balance, why do you think you're going to have it? Why? Because you deserve it? I don't think so. You deserve what you get in life by working hard. When my, our kids got out of, uh, and they went to great schools, when they got out of school, I said, be the first in the building and the last to leave. And my daughter said, Daddy, that's the janitor, the guy that cleans the floor. I said, yes, honey. Five months into her first job, she said, um, the chairman of the company, big company, said, whose light is that up there? Oh, that's Kelly Pena's. What is she? She gets to work at 5 o'clock, and then he's leaving. Whose light is that at 11.15 at night? Well, that's Kelly, it's still Kelly Pena. And, and I said also, if you're in sales, make 300 cold calls a day. 300 cold calls a day. And for those 300 you, cold calls a day. Correct. Will it still work nowadays? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. We got kids doing there it right now. There was a question. We even got some lazy Dutch kids doing it right now. Just pick up the phone. Yeah, yeah. Make and I call. mean, for a, for a Dutch kid, 24 years old, to make 20 cold calls a day, you'd think it's a big fucking deal. There's nobody's teaching sales in this country that I'm aware of that tells you to make 300 cold calls a day. In fact, there's nobody on the planet that I'm aware of that tells you to make 300 cold calls a day. I had a guy just do a $50 million deal. He said, Dan, if you had just told me I was 2,000 cold calls away from my first deal, I would have sent you a check for 20 grand and said thank you, and I wouldn't have come to the castle. Where's the fun part in your life? I'm having fun right now. I love what I do. Most of you in this audience don't like what you do. That's why, with the greatest respect, that's why Michael can help you. Most of the people on the 87, Gallup poll did a, a survey in 2016. 87% of the people on the planet, not counting all the uh, Biafra, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ghana, uh, Kenya kind of countries, 87% of the planet hate what they do. They've checked out. They're just taking up time, waiting for retirement. I'm sure some of you in this room can, can, can uh, you know, relate to that. 87% have checked out. Now, to me, if you've checked out, I mean, what the hell? Jesus. And you're all going to live older. The, the 70 is the new 50, they tell me. I don't, I don't even feel 50. I feel 30. I am 30. I got more energy than probably the whole room. Because well, I, I love dragging you sorry guys and gals across the goal line. My wife, lovely wife Sally, says the reason I have arthritis in my back is because you're getting heavy now that I'm getting older, dragging you across the goal line. But I will kick, spit, slap. I will do whatever it takes. And when I say I'll do whatever it takes, I fucking mean it. I will insult you, your mother, your religion. I know how to get you to the top of the podium at the Olympics. Not for a bronze medal, not for a silver, but for a fucking gold. If we're not going for gold, don't waste my time. I know how to do it. You named the word religion. Do you believe? Yes. I'm a, I'm a Catholic boy, altar boy. The you Catholic went to church? church? The Catholic church. I, the last thing I do every night is I fall asleep saying my prayers. My wife can attest to that. I fall asleep every single night saying my prayers. I have for 68 years. Prayers or affirmations? No. Affirmations first, prayers last. Prayers, I fall asleep doing. Because I, I don't want to fall asleep during my affirmations. If you do the prayers, you got to believe in something. Yeah, What's I believe that? in What's God. I do. Yeah? I believe in God, yeah. And you I think do. he I have no you. proof. Neither do you. I have no proof, but I have faith. Faith. And that's one of the, the missing things from your, a, a, not a journey, because life's not a journey. Journey, a journey are for uh, meatheads. Life is, find somebody who you want to be like and follow what he did. Just like Socrates, Plato, and, and, and Aristotle did 2,500 years ago. So I modeled very successful people, and that's what the whole program is based on. Um, the, um, but I, I, I believe, uh, and the kids that are the most successful, whether they're the lazy Dutch kids that I poke fun at, or uh, everybody else, is they, ha they, they have faith. 
But most of you don't have, and I say generally speaking, most of you don't have faith in yourselves because you have low self-esteem, no self-confidence. You look like shit. You dress like shit. And you, and you blame it on the 21st century, the reason why you dress the way you do. 25 years ago, if you come to a seminar like this, you'd all be wearing suit and tie. 40 years ago, the women would be wearing hats. This is my uniform. I, I, I don't go to sleep like this, but I mean, this is my uniform. It has been for a long, long, long time. Dress, if you want to get money from banks, dress like the president of your country. If you, unless you're from Pakistan or India or something. Dress like the president or the prime minister of your country. You only have one time to make a first impression, kids. You come in looking like some of you, I wouldn't give you fucking toilet paper. Most of you, I'd be embarrassed the way you're dressed. But see, Michael didn't bring me here to make... If I leave here with anybody liking me, I failed. You understand what I'm saying? I failed. I'm not here to be your friend. You want a friend, go get a fucking dog. I'm here to drag your sorry ass across the goal line, no matter what it takes. And there's no better on the planet than me at doing it, as demonstrated by all the tens of billions I've created. Can you imagine... Just, I'm getting all excited now. Just look at this. I, you know, even the sorriest ones in here are probably 50 million. And there's a couple of billionaires out there. I got a strain to find one, but I mean, there are. The odds are there's at least two or three billionaires in this room to be. Potentially. Yes, sir. Potentially. Two or three. But would those two or three make the sacrifices necessary? When but I was... What, what, what is necessary? What's the best advice? How the, to do the, it? The best advice is find something you love. Find something that can change a billion lives. Zuckerberg is a classic example. He changed more than a billion lives. Added value. <laughs> Correct. Added value, change, you make a billion lives better, potentially. You may not get to a billion people, but potentially you can make a billion lives better and the odds have just gone geometrically up for you to become a billionaire. And if not a billionaire, a whole bunch of money. There's going to be uh, six billion cell phones sold between now and 2030. Six billion more cell phones. There's going to be... Uh, uh, there's going to be um, third world countries are going to uh, uh, grow their consumption of Coca-Cola, soft drinks, and that kind of stuff by 1,000% between now and 2030. I can go down a whole list of things, but you're not working on any of those. If any of you are, speak French and are black, go to Haiti. They have nothing. If any of you speak Spanish uh, and uh, if Trump doesn't drop the, the, bomb, the trigger on Cuba, go to Cuba. They have nothing. Sally and I were just there. Uh, if any of you speak Farsi or Arabic, go to Iran. But now I'm not saying that because, you know, we're going to bomb Iran probably. And don't go to Syria. Just like I told people, if you spoke Russian, go to Russia back when the wall fell. Just like I told people when China opened up, learn Chinese. We send our youngest son. He speaks fluent uh, Mandarin. Uh, but no. Uh, Holland is have See? How many are willing to go to Haiti, learn French? Nobody. Anybody? No, I'm not going to. Those are just five off the top of my head. I got, I got 1,005 more. And we have people in Haiti right now. I have people in Iran right now. I have people in Russia right now. I have people in China now. If you, Brazil, you speak Portuguese, go to Brazil. So what you say is go there where they need They have no you. infrastructure. They have nothing. You can help other people and make money. Legally. That's the deal. Yes, sir. Give some, get some. And you'll be helping them more than they're helping you. So you give more than you take. That's always the rule. Correct. Correct. Honest, moral, ethical has got to be the three basis benchmarks. Even though you may sound that I think I sound different, but honest, moral, ethical. Those three. And um, there's so much money, God Almighty. Uh, one of my German kids, um, the last 18 deals he's done, he sent me his uh, stats, averaged 2% or 
was the borrowing rate from the bank, 2%. Jeez. And it's easier to do a 5 million than a 500,000, and it's easier to do a 50 million than a 5 million, and it's easier to do a 5 billion. Same paperwork, but you gotta have a big dream, big ideas. Big ideas, and there's certainly a lot of big ideas, and some of those ideas are on the, on the internet. They are. Most of them won't get there, but I mean, look at all the incubators, etc., cetera, in um, the Silicon Valley type places that are on the planet now. They're all over the place. And money, and there's, the, e, the, the European Union has money. The International Monetary Fund has money. The World Bank has money. I'm the only person on the planet that I know of that sends people to those three places to get money. The guy that got money from the uh, uh, World Bank took him 80 phone calls to 80 diff di different departments until he found the right department to get the money. The World Bank doesn't know what they're doing. The so International Monetary Fund doesn't know what they're doing. The EU for sure doesn't know what they're doing. They got tons of money. And governments, if they don't use the money, they lose it. But financing by banks has been changed over the past years. Yeah. Yeah. So if one go, goes to a bank now, what should you do? What should you tell them? Well, no, well, you, you got, no, you got to come up with uh, our system. My system is based on you find a mentor that's done it before you. You put a dream team together. And uh, so it's not just you. It's you with five or six guys that are gals that are really world class. And you've got plenty of them here in the Netherlands. I was telling you about my, one of my dream teams from the 90s with some very uh, well to do guys here in the Netherlands. And uh, you're going to, you know, and we're going to change. My idea is better than motherhood, apple pie, and religion. I mean, we're going to change the way the world is today. I mean, those are the kind of words you, that they use now. And the bankers give you the money. As outlandish as you, 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 the request might seem, they give you the money. They, I don't mean give it. They take it in the credit committee, yada, yada. So I'm not saying that they just you know, fall down dead and they throw the money at your feet. It'll, it'll seem that way in some of the cases. Because all the, like right now, uh, it used to be green. Everything green, green power was hot. That's passe now. Cybersecurity is the hottest thing on the planet today. Cybersecurity. There is nothing hotter. Cybersecurity. Pharmaceuticals is hot. Hot, 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 hot. Telecom? Well, still telecom, but there's, now there's different areas of telecom. Healthcare, um, uh, old age, uh, uh, assisted living. It's hot, 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 because none of you want to take care of your parents. You kick them out to the curb, you want to put them in some place for 1,100 euros or 1,200 euros or... I Luxury mean, elderly homes. Yeah, but they, you can pay up to 25,000 euros a month for the country club elderly homes. Dentists? Rolling up dentists. Dental, den, dentists are hot. We have a dentist here. Uh, Still uh, hot? Um, uh, what do you call it? It doesn't matter where you do that. Here you can, you can in the take, States, They wherever. don't have yellow pages anymore, but they used to have yellow pages. You can just throw the yellow pages down, and wherever it opens up. Um, physiotherapy. Who is a dentist going to give his practice to? You want a motivated seller between 55 and 65, 67-ish, who has no plan of succession, meaning they have nobody to give their business to, their kids don't want it. Crematoriums are hot, pun intended. Funeral homes are hot. Cemeteries are hot. But see, you don't want to do those. I can just tell by the look in their faces. Right now, uh, um, radiology clinics are hot. Oh, God. Uh, uh, surgical uh, care centers are hot. I mean, I can just go on and on and on because there's no plan of succession. Meaning, what are you going to do when the four doctors that had the radiology practice, now they're in their 60s or 70s, what are we going to do with it? They're going to sell it to some meathead like you if you're there. But if you don't ask, you don't get. As Bruce the Whipple, one of my great mentees, told me many, many years ago, actually, he's not the first person. I've been giving him credit for 25 years. But actually, Costa Grazos, the CEO of Onassis Group, who was my mentor, told me, 
if you don't ask, Mr. Pena, you cannot get. So I used to carry that forward into my uh, love life. If you don't ask, you don't get, right, guys? You named Costa Grazos. Costa Grazos, yes, sir. He was one of your heroes, Correct. mentors. Where did you find your teachers? How did you meet I them? I was in the oil business, and I was uh, in Onassis uh, Tower, Olympic Tower. The shipping on lines. Oil, oil deal in New York City. And this little guy, really well-dressed guy, walked in, shuffled around, talked to some people, and he left. And I said, well, who is that man? He says, he's Constantine Grazos. He's the chief executive officer of Onassis uh, Shipping. He was the right-hand man for 60 years of uh, Aristotle Onassis. He's head of the Onassis Trust. I mean, he looked like a movie star. So next day I come, this is before they had security in buildings and metal detectors and all that stuff. I went from the top floor down, and I kept on looking for his office, and I found him. And I knocked on the door, his, his assistant opened the door, he says, yes, I'd like to see Mr. Grazos. And he says, do you have an appointment? I go, no. But he could see me through the door, and he goes, and I walked in, and uh, I said, uh, can I buy you lunch? Uh, and uh, that's how uh, the relationship started. I've always gone after, when I see somebody, um, when I was young, uh, I went out, when I saw somebody that looked like a movie star walking in a room, and people got quiet, whether they were a movie star or not, I knew he commanded the, the command presence that I wanted. And so I, I went, introduced myself, and, uh, and that's how that started. And I met, I met all kinds of, that's how I met uh, 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 President Trump, before he was president, a long time ago. But you have to have, you can't go up there stuttering, with your hands sweating and dressed like you, with the greatest respect. So they actually, just, it's easy to do. Yes, sir. It's absolutely dead easy. Almost everybody can do it. Well, follow the rules. Every, you know, everybody, if they dress like a, like a person, <laughs> like a, like the president of your country. Some people, again, I'm sure this is not the case for your audience, Michael, but. Some people dress the way you do, kids, because you don't want the opportunity. You've been engaging in self-sabotaging activity so long, it's become a way of life for you. But success leaves clues. If all these guys work 80, 100, 120 hours a week that change the world, Success leads clues. God Almighty. Elon Musk is a hard bastard. Henry Ford was a hard bastard. Rockefeller and, you know, uh, well, my, my uh, interfacing with the Heineken family, and he's, he was a hard bastard, you know. So how do you think the world got changed? Flappy happy? Uh, I'll have another cappuccino. Is that how it happened? I don't think so. Now, you may not, you know, my, my, Dan Penny isn't for everybody. I understand that. I can't understand it, really. But my wife tells me, you're not everybody's cup of tea. So I understand it. I don't want to believe it, but I know it's true. I'm 72 years old. But the, all the people I've been privileged to be around, I've been around some big, big hitters. They're all the same. But now, because of everything's on iPhones, they're trying to paint their legacy. Now they don't swear on camera. Now they, they don't do all these things because they want their legacy. I don't give a shit about my legacy. I want my legacy. When the margins come down in a thousand years, well, who is that crazy guy? You know, I want him to know that because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not running for office. I'm not a politician. I gave up. I wanted to be a priest when I was a young guy, but that's not going to happen. I'm not going to be pope. But if I had become a priest, you bet your last gilder, if you still got any, that I would have been Pope. And you know, except from recent years, all the Popes were ruthless for those Catholics in the room. Right? The Inquisition, all those terrible things. And now we got a Pope who's trying to be a good guy, and I just hope nobody shoots him or anything. Did your life change over the past 20, 25 years? Absolutely. Yeah? I, I, in what way? I, I, I hate to admit it, but I actually get, I get uh, a melancholy about all the people, I, I the see you, you I, of I, all the thousands and thousands of people that I've helped, uh, it's a good feeling. 
Mm -hmm. That's a good feeling. But I see you do bungee jumping. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jumped Crazy off. stuff. Jumped off a um, 108-story uh, building in uh, Las Vegas earlier this year, which was uh, I shouldn't have done. My wife told me not to do it because I, I just got two artificial knees. I have these all titanium from here to here. And Sally says, Dan, go watch them land. I said, I don't want to watch them land. I don't want any negative in my head. I just want to jump off 108 stories, 855 feet, and I, I didn't land right because you have to land in a circle about this big and it's cement and I didn't land right. I landed on one foot and I fucked up this knee a little, but it's, it's all right now. But, the, but I continue to do stuff like that to press the envelope because it's easy to get comfortable. I have not had to work in 35 years. I have not had to do anything in 35 years. Yet I'm, I'm sure if we took an average, I've maybe doubled the average weekly work of this audience by me. I'm 131 years old. We did a calculation two years ago uh, because I, of all the hours uh, I work. Instead of 70, I'm 131 because I've worked almost twice as many hours as uh, the norm. Is there anything left for you to wish for? Yeah, I, I, I want to go to the moon. We shared it. I want to go to the moon. Yeah. And uh, I want to hit a trillion dollars. I will hit a trillion dollars for the meatheads. Uh, and um, the, um, I want to bring as many in, in when they talk about great coaches uh, or great uh, in, uh, deities, there's God, there's Buddha, uh, there's Muhammad, and Pena. And That'll so be great. In, in the great reverse, painting. In the reverse. Pena, God, you know, and the, because uh, I'm clearly the best on the planet today. There's no, not anyone even remotely close to what I've accomplished. To you, and I get I get off vicariously bringing somebody that shouldn't make a penny, not a gilder. But somehow I, I made you make a hundred million dollars or gilders or a pound or euros now, because I am the best on the planet at getting you to do what you don't want to do because you're a lazy fuck to get what you want to out of life. Nobody's better than I am. Nobody, and I know it. And not everybody loves me, and I don't care. That's good. Again, if I leave here with anybody liking me, I fail. I fail. You have another mission. Yeah, I'm on a mission. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm obsessed. If you can't tell ob obsession, who did I study um, speech giving when I was learning to be a, a world-class speaker? Hitler, Churchill, Kennedy, Stalin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Those are the movies that I watched. Hitler was arguably the greatest orator the planet has ever seen, ever, including Jesus Christ. Being a high-performance person doesn't mean you're a good guy. And bad things happen to good people every single day. And some of you in the audience don't want, you, you can't, that doesn't resonate well with you. Tomorrow, you will be here. Yes, sir. 90 minutes. QLA talk. You will explain more about QLA, high performance, self-esteem, all the shit we need to know. Correct. I have one more question for yes, sir. today. What do you imagine you become? Visualize. Live within when you're without. Can you tell a little bit about that? To finish? Well, well a par part of the five um, the credos. credos of success is um, the um, live when you're without, within when you're without. In other words, when I was a young man, I didn't call it smelling the leather, but I, when I was a young man, I used to go to uh, uh, Ferrari dealerships. I used to, this is in the early 70s, I used to go to $2 million houses. And a $2 million house in the 1971 and two was behemoth. I used to go to La Quinta Country Club where the night rental for one uh, uh, bedroom uh, room was $215 a month, and my rent for my home was $205 a month, and it was $215 a night. So I've always pushed myself. I've been driving Rolls Royces since I was 25 and a half. My first Rolls Royce, in fact, I found a picture of it the other day, and I, it's part of the seminar now. Uh, my my so Rolls Royce is 25 and a half. Um, 
That's living within when you're without. But did you visualize? Oh your yes, life? to visualize. I saw myself in the castle. In the castle, I, uh, the the painting of me in front of a castle is not my castle. It's how I saw myself. Uh, but I saw my castle had a moat, had two tennis courts. Uh, the uh, uh, we've torn down the one tennis court. We built a golf course. We don't have a moat. We have a big lock. I saw my children, our children, being raised by nannies and governesses. Uh, the um, I saw us dressing for every meal in tuxedo every night when my kids were little, dressed up in tuxedo. My kids hate wearing, uh, wearing tuxedos now, and I, I overdid it a little there. But anyway, uh, we used to play tennis in the snow and the rain. My kids hate tennis to this day. So I learned some things there, you know. The um, um, but being around and being exposed um, to wealth, I've always uh, worn expensive clothes. Um, and of course now I can't get much more expensive suits now, but I mean when I was young um, uh, I know the difference between a bespoke suit and a tailor-made suit most of you don't that's fine you Google it uh, And or a suit off the peg, you know where you buy just out of the store and those are the things and and they're important you do what for your kids and your employees your kids and employees don't do what you tell them to do. They do what they see you do. Most of you have bad ha you have habits, but most of them are bad. So we have to change yeah, that. Yeah, and some of them, that, some of you have aspirations to have your children get good grades, right? A's. They have A's, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you weren't an A student. How do you think that resonates with your kids? Oh, he's full of shit like he always is. Especially if you're successful. I now realize my kids didn't have, our kids didn't have to go to big time universities, multiple degrees. I didn't believe that years ago. I mean, you, you need to you, immerse yourself. Immerse yourself. It's better to go to a, uh, a, um, a Michelin star restaurant like you were kind enough to take us last night. One night a month, then go out four nights a week. That's the best advice for today. Thank you so much. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pena. Thank you. Thank the you. $50 billion man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. See you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very honored and grateful that he's here. Ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome for the $50 billion man, Mr. Dan Pena. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to um, dispel a couple of myths. I got some uh, correspondence or emails from some of you um, about religion. And some of you were perhaps not um, of the uh, belief that I really do fall asleep saying my prayers every night, which I do. But the, uh, Michael has been a very successful mentee of mine for many years, and I have a number of very successful mentees. But you know you're at the top of your game when your mentee gets to see the Pope. I can't get in to see the Pope. But one of my Catholic mentees get on to see the Pope, and this is a gift from the Pope to me. Now, I don't know uh, uh, what Michael's religion is, and I don't care, and I don't care what your religion is, but I just, I, I want to dispel, just because my wife and I have so supported St. Teresa for 20 year plus years, uh, I don't want too much religious uh, connotation to go that I'm holy, because I'm not. Uh, the, uh, what I am is that just in case there is a God, I'm paving my way into heaven by charity, charitable donations, just as Bill and Melinda Gates, just as Warren Buffett, just as Steve Jobs before he died, just as most of the, the very uh, wealthy guys. Is that you, Frank? Yes. Jesus Christ Almighty. <laughs> it shows I never thought he'd live this long. But anyway, uh, because if there is, you notice when people turn in their 50s, 60s, maybe late 60s, they start to do things that are out of character for what got them all their money. 
Bill and Melinda Gates is a prime example. The reason that they're given a lot of money, billions, tens of billions, is that just in case, Steve Jobs, same, just in case. Now, I have more faith. I've had faith, same prayers since I'm a little boy. So I'm actually a bit more of a believer than they are, in my judgment. But uh, thank you for the emails. I also got a couple of invitations by a couple of the ladies in the audience saying that I should stop by tonight after 10 where their husbands go to work. Uh, I showed them to my wife and I showed them to Vinica, my longtime uh, colleague. Um, but that can only happen in Holland because Holland is heaven, right? Holland is heaven. Now, I'm not here to insult you, but I will. I'm not here to hurt your feelings, but I will. I'm not here to make you think that you have wasted 20 to 30 or 40 years of your goddamn life, but I will. Because most of you have. In the cosmos of time, there's nobody in the audience that is more than a fart in the wind. I'm not a more than a fart in the wind. Bill Gates is more than a fart in the wind. Unless you can change the lives of a billion people, and Mr. Zuckerberg, using that as a definition, has changed the lives of a billion people, but how many Mark Zuckerbergs are there on the planet? 10, 20, 30, Henry Ford, to name one. What we're going to talk about here today is the same similar talk that I give to the universities, at Oxford University, uh, at universities in Poland, in America. And for those of you, as I mentioned yesterday, I taught at Nairobi at one time. It's hard to believe, but I did back in the middle 90s. Uh, but the world has changed. And it's changed because wealth, risk, reward, not. The way I was taught as a young man, go to school, may or may not go to university, work hard, and at the end of 40 years, maybe you get a gold watch. Maybe. Those days are done. They've been done for decades. Who's teaching anything different now? Nobody. Nobody. When I was in Poland giving talks, when I've been in the UK giving talks, in Canada giving talks, in the United States giving talks, I asked the same questions, which I'm going to get around to in a couple minutes. But basically, the kids are disillusioned. But they're smart enough to realize something's fucked up. I alluded to it last night when I was here. They realize their parents are talking rubbish, but now they can find out about just going on online. When I was a kid, I would, first of all, there was no online, and I would no more correct my parents than I would, you know, jump off a building. But the kids know that this system is bust. They know it's not possible or at least it's very unlikely. Nobody in school, whether it's grammar school, junior high school, college, university, undergraduate or graduate, teaches you how to buy businesses, how to sell businesses, and how to show leadership. Because that's what you need to create wealth for you to retire on. If you can't do one of the, all those three, you're fucked. And I know for a fact, none of you went to university where they teach those three. Why? Because there are no universities that teach those three. When I went to Oxford, I said, how many of you had classes in buying a business? No hands go up. How many have you had classes in selling a business? No hands go up. How many have you had classes in leadership? No hands go up. And I turned to the dean of the school, and you call this a school of business? What the fuck? And your education is no different. In fact, Holland being heaven and all is probably less. Now, the exception to that rule is when I was in Nairobi 20 years ago, they were beginning to make a transformation. And uh, a lady named Nellie, uh, Nellie something or other was the dean of the school then, who went on to uh, serve in government. And I also heard that she's now been in trouble si since her days at Nairobi. But they were starting to. Now, I don't know if they followed through. But the kids know that this isn't possible. This isn't happening. What you're not taught in school is really the ability to succeed depends on the power of the human spirit. Now, Michael alludes to that. He's more a human spirit person than I am. But at the end of the day, he's told me, some of you have approached him, does it really take 80, 100 hours a week? Does it this? I've never seen a high-performance person that was part-time. I'm going to say that again for you lazy Dutchmen and Dutch ladies. I've never seen a high-performance person that was part-time. Never. In 50 years of business. 50 years of business. The $50 billion that I've created, 
and I've created a lot more than 50, and I told you one of the reasons we're going to keep it at 50 billion. I just got a suit. This isn't it. This is 50 billion dollar man down where the pinstripes are. I just got it. So we're going to wait till I'm a, a, a trillion dollar man before I just bought it. So if you don't have the power of the human spirit, if you really don't believe in yourself, and we already talked about it, you don't have self-esteem, you don't have self-confidence, you don't feel self-worth, we're going to explain exactly why you don't have those things. But I'll give you a hint. Mommy and daddy fuck you up big time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what if you could accomplish in the world today if you weren't afraid? If you weren't afraid of what people thought of you, said about you, whispered about you, what could you accomplish? A lot more than you've accomplished today. A lot more. Why do we care what people think? Why do we care what people say? And more importantly, why do we care what people whisper? Because we have no self-worth. We have next to little self-esteem. And we have no self-confidence. And how do we get that way? Yes, mommy and daddy. Life expands and contracts with courage. When was the last courage, uh, courage type thing that you did in your lifetime? Walk against the red light? Whisper that your spouse, your significant other is a bitch or a, a, a bastard? When was the last time you exhibited some courage? Some of you have to go back a long, long way. Some of you never. I said yesterday, I cannot believe that there are people in this audience that have never been spanked, never had a, a harsh word said to them by their parents, never got in a fight on the school grounds. I can't believe that. And you wonder why you are the, the way you are. Now, I'm not saying that um, being a high-performance person is beating the shit out of everybody, but it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Intensity is the price of excellence. How many of you are intense? Now, you asked uh, Michael, at least some of you, the question, uh, can I do this part-time? Can I do this 10 hours a week? You know who you are. You know the answer, don't you? We're going to show some examples of the current day Vogue entrepreneurs, stroke leaders in the world, i.e. Elon Musk, i.e. Bill Gates, to name a few. And we're going to go back a few hundred years, or not a few hundred years, a few decades, and we're going to see uh, what clues they left. Most people buy what they need. Some people buy what they want. QLA buys what you dream for. I have affirmations every night. I say prayers every night. I only got about 10% through my prayers last night. I had too much to drink. We went to whatever that restaurant is, Michelin star, Japanese something or other, and I discovered a new sake, which was, didn't bode well for my... By the time we got back to our suite, I, was just, I, got, I think I said two prayers out of the 23. So two's better than none. But um, I still have dreams, and my affirmations are based on those, uh, on those dreams. I have dreams for you. I have dreams for Michael. I used to have dreams for Frank. But now that I know he's alive again, he's going to go back on my prayer list. He's going to go back on my prayer list. If anything uh, in this seminar offends you, blame your parents for raising a pussy. Blame your parents for raising a pussy. I said yesterday, when I was at Oxford, I told him about one of my mentees who made several hundred million dollars. Not one of the mentees, or excuse me, not one of the audience asked me, Mr. Pena, what was the name of that mentee? Why do you think they didn't ask what his name was? His name was Chris Josefowicz, for starters. Okay. When I was in Poland, as I said last, yesterday afternoon, I, I, I talked about some very successful kids, and I said, Jan, stand up. He's 22 years old. He's currently a student at uh, Krakow University, he made a million euros last year, which is no big fucking deal to me, but to most of you, a million euros is a big deal. Now, one single student went up to ask him what his name was. Jan what? Because if they did, and he told them the tip, the secret, the secret sauce, they may feel some responsibility to try to do it themselves. And then when they failed, then they're fucked. 
You know most of the podcasts, most of the seminars, most of the various things that you study, you're not learning shit. Otherwise, why are you still here with the greatest respect to Michael? There's no reason. When you leave here today, after the q and is over, and I've already told you everything's free on my website. I don't, I, I, and when you see me at the airport, don't come up and talk to me. Don't touch me. I don't give a shit if you live or die. My obsession is to drive as many of you lazy bastards across the goal line as humanly possible before I die. That's it. If I have to hurt you, spit on you, call your mother a whore, I don't care. Most of your mothers were whores. We'll get to that a little later. We'll get to that a little later. The 2% mindset. These are the things that you do outside the circle, but your comfort zone is based on fear, procrastination, selling for less, settling for less, regret, etc., etc. 98% of the people in this room are in the 98%, not the 2%. But I can say that in any room. QLA isn't about being a 2%er. QLA is being about a 0.0002%. Of the 7.5 billion people on the planet, maybe a half a million people are capable of doing this. So some of you say, oh, fuck. I'm glad he said that because now I don't have to pay attention anymore because I'm certainly not one of those. Uh, right? Right. I've given this talk a lot of times. I can read fear. Yesterday I told Michael, I smelled fear. It was like I was in a fucking mortuary last, yesterday afternoon. All you guys, your balls are sucked, if you have any, are sucked up in, the, in, in your cavity. Why? What the fuck happened? What happened to the freedom fighters of World War II? Fighting the, Nazis, fighting the Nazis, what happened to you? What was that, your great-grandfather? Grand, at least your great-grandfather, probably. Same question I asked in Poland. You can't find anybody with a set of balls in Poland anymore. Not possible. They're all dead. And their genes died out. No different throughout Europe, but it's no different throughout the United States either. So it's not just you. It's everywhere. We're gonna, you'll better appreciate why by the end of this hour, hour and a half. Now, you've already read, some of you, that I am the creator of Teenage Multimillionaires from scratch and the, me the um, mentee that's the CEO of the largest deal in recorded history, the $500 billion deal, Neom, the city of the future. I created them both. Just like God with fucking clay, with these two fucking hands, I made them just like fucking God. And everybody in between, which covers everybody in this room, Teenage multimillionaire, no school, no high school, no junior high school, no college, 17 years old. Why not you? The answer is it could be you. But he's a hard-working, 140-hour-a-week worker. Not an 80. A good, straight, a good drink and a stiff fuck could kill everybody in this room. And you're nodding your head, yeah. But some of you will just settle for the good fuck. Most guys come to me because I'm the alpha male father they never had. Most young guys come to me because they can't get their willy wet. Now what the fuck's the world come to? You gotta come to a raging, crazy old fucking man, 72 years old, to get your willy wet. What's happened? Almost everything bad. That's what's happened. But it's not just money that I produce. This young kid that came to me a year and a half ago, his goal, his dream in his life was to finish number one university champion archer in Britain. What's the best you've ever done? 20th in a regional meet, he says to me. So we set up a program and I beat him like a fucking rented mule. That's him receiving the first place a couple months ago in Britain. The little skinny shit. He looks like a, a little Nimrod uh, snowflake, because he is. But he was firing six, seven hundred arrows a day. Most of you couldn't fire 50. 
So it's not just that. They, the girls tell me I'm better at knocking off weight off your big fat asses than I'm making money. I take like a change on I, You know, when a woman is walking away from you and it looks like two, uh, pigs in a gunny sack, you know what I'm talking about? I just take a fucking chainsaw and chop their cheeks off. That's one of my examples. Just one. They lose 100 pounds, 150 pounds, 75 kilos. Because I don't, live them, I don't allow them to not be accountable. When I say you're going to weigh yourself fucking four times a day, sweetheart, that's what the fuck I mean. Most of you in this room have never been held accountable for anything in your life. And look at the result. Don't you got something better to do on the weekends? And I just found out this was a church of some description. So, okay. I'm not asking for any forgiveness. Now, the first step towards success is taken when you refuse to be captive of the environment which you were first found yourself. Now, I'm going to tell this is my first story about religion. You remember the pope before the pope, Nazi pope, the German pope, Ratzinger, right? About four or five years ago, he went online or got his first Twitter account. So I decided to tweet him. It was one of my first tweets as well. The next day, he resigned. The next day. Now, what I tweeted the Pope, and I, between the three of us, him, the Pope, and me. 20 years before that, I decided I'm coming back to the church and I'm going to start going to confession for Catholics, or reconciliation, as it's called now. So I called one of my good friends, who's a, po- uh, a priest, uh, uh, John Fogarty, uh, Carmelite priest, Irish, and I said, I want to come back to church, I want to go to confession. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll baptize your kids and all that stuff. I'll, I'll hear your confession. No, no, no. I want a, a senior pope to you, John. So two days later, he calls me up. I got just a perfect priest, a, war, a wartime priest from the Vietnam War. Been shot up and did a Monsignor Parasina. So I prepare, I go to his, his uh, the rectory, uh, and I've got a legal pad this high, like this, yellow. Every single line on both pages, the entire tablet filled with my sins for the per- previous 25 years. I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been 27 years since my last confession. I, start, I got to page three, the top of page three, and he says, excuse me, Mr. Penny, give me that pad a minute. So he looks at it. He looks at me. He puts it down. And he says, Sodom and Gomorrah have got nothing on you, Mr. Penny. You've done it all. I never looked at it that way, Monsignor, but I guess you're right. I have done it all. He took it, and he ripped it up, and he went into the fireplace, and he threw it in the fireplace. First he asked me, are there any other copies? I said, no, Monsignor. He threw it in the fireplace, and then he, we sat down. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I worked hard for that, to put all that stuff down. I might write a book someday. No, no, you don't want to put that in a book, Mr. Penny, for sure. So he says, uh, and he said, he gave me absolution, bless you, blah, 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 and then all done. So well, what about my penance? For those of you that are Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. You know, what am I going to say? Nothing. You go home and kiss your wife, hug her, and tell your kids you love them, and that's your penance. Because there's no penance for what you've done, Pena. Short of death. I've got, I've got tons of stories. At the end, if we've got time, I'm going to give you my exorcism story. When God and I were going to mano y mano, duke it out. Why I'm so popular the last five, six, seven, eight years, after 20 years or 18 years of being in the, in the hinterland, is because there's no compression algorithm for experience. You can't write a program for what I've lived through. None of you whiz kids, computer kids, can write an algorithm for what I fucking lived through. The young kids that you go listen to are young kids that you go listen to. I'll leave it at that, because I'm not here to slag any of them off. But none of them know anything about anything, about anything. What would you rather have, somebody that read 700 books or somebody that's done 700 deals? I stopped counting at 700. I'm over 1,100 now transactions in my life. 
Tonight, when I drink some more sake, I will lose more brain cells than this whole motherfucking room has. And I hear with a, a purported one or two of you are big hitters. You know what this means? That's what I got for your big hitter. Because all you've seen is a pile of shit. Like from the famous movie from Jurassic Park. That's all you've learned. You know nothing. Some of you could barely pay the gun to this goddamn thing, which is a fucking embarrassment. And then they get beat up by some old senile man. Ain't life wonderful? And life is not a fucking journey. It's only if you're a meathead, clubfoot retard. And if for those of you, I'm not trying to, if some of you are, have uh, issues with retardation, I'm not trying to, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. It's a model. You find someone, as I said yesterday after, where, where he or she is where you want to be. And then you model them. You mimic them. You copy them. Same way you would if you want to be a footballer. Same way you want to be if you want to be um, uh, a golfer. You don't copy some monkey uh, that can't break 100, do you? What was the name of our footballer on our board? Yeah. Which didn't mean anything to me, but it meant everything to everybody we talked about 20 years ago. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle had this figured out two, 3,000 years ago. What the fuck happened? Why'd we stop? These are arguably the first mentor-mentee relationships that existed on the planet. I'm not teaching anything new, guys, gals. I give credit to the man that I copied, Andrew Carnegie. Came up with the QLA model and didn't call it QLA because he, was a, he, was, he could have been Dutch, really. He was a meat, mean, cheap person that didn't want to spend money, so he didn't allow equity in his transactions. He only used debt, as you would say, debt. So he would still own it all, and that's all I did. He was doing this 140 years ago, what I do. Why don't investment bankers, why does an ING bank teach you how to do this? Because there's no fees for them to collect. That's why. Now, everything has got derivatives. It's got this, it's got that, and everything is associated with a fee and another fee and a fee and a fee. That's why the world isn't being taught this, because there's no money in it. Now, the next part of the equation is why isn't anybody teaching it anyway, like me? Because nobody's done it. They've grown up in the new investment bank world. I didn't create $50 billion by accident. And on top of it, they call it a rags to riches. Well, I, I was poor, got in a lot of trouble. A few months ago when we were working, I'm, I signed a deal for a TV show a few weeks ago, and they were doing research, and we discovered that where I lived in 1972 on 27th and Lexington, when I first went to Wall Street, so we've now been torn down. We used to call the building the bed bug. Probably some of you live in the bed bug now. And uh, then 12 years later, I was living in the castle. 12 years. Yes, was a castle on my, my affirmations? Yes. Was a castle uh, on my uh, goals? Yes. Was a castle in my prayers? Yes. But I thought the castle was going to have a moat and have all kind of neat stuff. It doesn't have a moat, but it's a pretty neat place, for those of you that have looked at it in Google, because I continue to believe. I continue to believe. So I've gone from the barrio, that's where my house used to be, behind that chain link fence, and you can see between me and that brick wall isn't very much space. We had an 800 square foot house. I think that's 75 square meter house. Even some of you probably live in bigger houses than that. And of course, there I am with my lovely wife uh, on my 75th birthday. I needed a new Rolls Royce like I needed AIDS. So what did my wife give me for my 75th birthday? A Rolls just like the queen has. So when we drive by, I go, just like she does. I haven't driven in 30 years. Now, this is slightly out of sync because of where we are, but I'm a first-generation Mexican. My mother and grandmother swam across the Rio Grande River, 
where President Trump's going to build a wall to keep all my people out, which I agree with President Trump on building that wall, by the way. But that's not this kind of seminar, but I'm just telling you, I'm for the wall. I'm for the wall. But I'm first generation. As far as we can tell, I'm the most successful first generation anything in the United States of America. I'm the most successful first generation anything in the United States of America. Not even counting creating $50 billion with meatheads like you. Yet I didn't get invited to the inauguration. My mentees got invited. I don't get invited by the Pope. My mentees do. And there I was, getting blessed by the Queen last year. It's the first time I bowed my head in a long time. I'm very proud of that. But what we are going to talk about the rest of the afternoon, and hopefully, and there are such things as stupid questions. So when we get around to Q&A, don't be asking your meathead fucking questions. I'll come down and fucking choke you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, let's talk about some rich guys from the Netherlands. Took me a while to find some. Well, now, one of, my, one of these guys is dead. Died last year. This was for 2017. However, you say, him, is that the guy that's dead? Yeah. He's dead. He looks like, he, I don't know how he can be rich, but he looks poor. Okay. Now, he kind of looks like a Michael. He thinks he's a movie star or some shit. Okay. And then that guy, and then, of course, my fave, the Lady Heineken, uh, the daughter of the person that sponsored me into the Amstel Club 25 years ago or 22 years ago. So you've got rich people, right? Most of you aren't hanging, not chilling with those people, are you? Nope. Why? You've got all kinds of reasons why, don't you? I didn't go to school, but that's what I got to say about all those reasons. I didn't either. But somehow I weaseled my way into people richer than that in a good way. Because it was important to me to change my life from being the barrio bad boy who almost killed his teacher when he was 12 years old. If success was important to you, you would have done something about it by now. But it's not too late. It's never too late. Because you've been staying in your comfort zone. The situation where one feels safe and at e uh, or at ease, the trip is an attempt to take the students out of their comfort zone, a settled method of working. You've been in your comfort zone on your sorry asses for years. Why? We do what not our parents tell us to do. We do and did what our parents, we saw them do. Your, as I said yesterday, your kids and grandkids aren't going to do what you tell them to do. They're going to do what you, they see you do. And most of you are shitty parents. Most of you should have never had kids, and you should have never been born. But I'll get around to that in about a half an hour. When I prove to you, beyond a shadow of a motherfucking doubt, you're an accident. But I say that to the end, because of a little sizzle. But success does leave clues. I said this yesterday. I asked you yesterday, would you want your kids to be like you? I didn't see anybody jumping up and saying yes. Would you want your kids to be like your best friends, the people you hang with? No. So why are you hanging with them? Bill Gates, Elon Musk don't chill. They don't go to the World Cup. They don't go to the Super Bowl. They don't go to all, they don't even watch them on fucking TV. Why do you? Because most people are living quiet lives of desperation. I'm going to say it again real slow because the Dutch are a little slow. Like Michael said, got to talk slow to them, Dan. You are leave it, le leading and living quiet lives of desperation. Because your parents lived quiet lives of desperation. And their parents. And maybe then the ones before that that fought off the Nazis. We got to go back, what, 70 years? It's no different in America, so you're not alone. Actually, the biggest snowflakes I've talked to are in Poland, where they were great fighters, supposedly. I asked, what happened in 866 in Poland? These are universe, these are bright kids, supposedly. Nobody raises their hand. Finally, a professor, embarrassed, 
who's sitting about where you are. And that's when they had uh, anointed or discovered or initiated the country, 866. Not one single student in the audience knew. You go to American universities, you ask them, who was George Washington? Nobody knows. Who was Abraham Lincoln? Nobody knows. George Washington, first president, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, just for you, you know, just in case you don't know. But they know that um, Obama, and I don't think much of the President Obama, other than when he set the goal when he was 19 years old, a fucking crackhead dope addict, I'm going to be the first black president in the United States, that's a bodacious goal. And I take my hat off to him for that. But other than that, I don't think he's worth a shit. And he knows it. He's not losing any sleep over it. But success leaves clues. The fact that I have 50 mentees that I train just like God made them, that are super high performance people going to Trump's inauguration, going to see the Pope, making tens of billions, says something about my style. You're thinking and asking yourselves, and some of you ask Michael, why is he so damn hard on everybody? Kids, because it fucking works. I could be soft and I'd turn on people like you, and then wouldn't I be proud? Leaving a legacy of a bunch of limp dick wusses. Now, he's the flavor of the day right now. I don't know him personally. He's one of the few we're going to talk about today that I don't know personally. But notorious workaholic, Elon is so tied to his office that he's been known to sleep. All these guys I'm about to talk about sleep at their office, just like I did. And I already answered the work-life balance. There are work-life choices and they have consequences. Okay. His favorite word is fuck. Remember? From yesterday. Okay. Um, SpaceX worker revealed a brutal company model, helped him serve all-nighters working at Elon Musk. And it goes on to talk about 12, 15, 18 hour days and how he got chastised for going to see his son born. Now, I draw the line there. I've seen all my children born. That's why I draw the line though. For two minutes I saw him born. Then I'm gone. Okay. An Apple Inc. CEO, Cook, regularly begins sending emails at 4.30 a.m. and previously held Sunday night uh, staff meetings by telephone to prepare for the next week. Cook shared uh, in uh, May 2013 that his leadership focused on people, strategy, and execution. He explained, if you get those three right, the world, the world is a great place. 4.30 in the morning. I call people at 2 in the morning. I want to know why they don't pick it up on the second ring. And so do all the other guys. Now, Netherlands vis-a-vis -vis worldwide competition or competitiveness is fourth on the planet. Hard to believe being here, but it's fourth. I mean, but it is. Behind the United States, Singapore, and Switzerland. Now, being in Switzerland, it's hard to believe there, right, is it well? I mean, you've got to look real hard to find anybody that works in Switzerland. But, okay, Singapore, I know. United States, I know. But we have guys from Estonia. We've got guys from uh, so, some of my current stars of the day are from third world countries. Are third world countries. Okay. Now, as I alluded to yesterday, my demographics have changed from the days that I knew this young man in the front. They were 35 to 55 people followed me. Now they're 15 to 35 because now they know the world's fucked up. Risk, wealth, risk, reward, not, right? So we have a lot of youngsters. We have a lot of uh, youngsters more than we used to. And I'm about 55% male followers and 45 female. And that's way up from 10, 20 years ago. Used to be less than 5% ladies, then less 10% ladies, then 20. Then all of a sudden the ladies have made a surge for the line, the goal line. And so now we, we have quite a few. And, the, um, and that's good. That's a good thing. Because I, I don't believe there should be inequality. I'm, I'm pro-woman and all that stuff. I'm pro-woman and all that stuff. You wouldn't think so listening to me, but I am. Now, I alluded to this yesterday, and a couple of people emailed me. They didn't believe me. I didn't have this chart up yesterday. Lowest interest rates in 5,000 years. 5,000 years. They're giving away money. Give, even ING. 
She bastards there are giving away money. There is more money flush in the world today than there has been ever. Whether you like President Trump or not, we're in the Trump era. He has changed finance forever. Now, I knew him 25 years ago. I haven't talked to him in 20, over 20 years. And what he was doing with uh, China and uh, the Rocket Man, etc., is called takeaway selling. I mentioned this yesterday. Takeaway. you got to be able to walk out the door and say, fuck you, I'm not doing it. When was the last time you saw a politician do that? Never. Never. There's only three things that I might have mentioned yesterday that he hasn't done. That I, I made a list of 20 things when he got elected. He was going to do. He's done 17. There's only three he hasn't done. Bomb North Korea, bomb Syria, and bomb Iran. Those are the only three he hasn't done. And now he's playing kissy face with Rocket Man, so maybe that won't happen. But there's still a, and, and this is, I'm not giving secrets. It was in uh, Time Magazine a few weeks ago. 95% of the war game simulation at the Pentagon 95% of war game simulation at the Pentagon is for one thing, invading North Korea. I'm going to say it again, slow for you meatheads. 95% of the fucking simulation war games at the Pentagon are for one goddamn thing. And Rocket Man knows that. That's why he's playing kissy face. Now he may pull away from the table because he understands the takeaway sale as well. China realizes that. And you're back here. There was no sunlight this morning on the, on the terrace to the hotel. Otherwise, I'd be hollering as heaven again, you know, having a cappuccino with the sun on my face. But the sun has been on your brains too long. It's baked them for several hundred years. See, it's considered in poor taste to think like that. Not where I come, not, oh, not where I chill. Not. I'm not snorting cocaine. I'm snorting that. And you've all been told this lie, this myth. Money is dirty. It's not important. What a fucking brain dead told you that. Well, I have other values that are more important. And as I said yesterday, if you don't think money can buy happiness, you don't know where the fuck to shop. Everybody in this room could use 10 million euros yesterday. But money's not important, right? The first method of estimating the intelligence of a ruler is the look the man he has around him. If I were to judge you by the guys you chill with, you hang with, how would I judge you, young man? How would I judge you, young lady? I'd probably judge you a dipshit, fucking retard. Early dementia set in on you. Why? And again, if I leave here with anybody even remotely liking me, I fucking fail. By the look on your sorry fucking faces, that ain't going to be my problem. How would you be judged today by the people, the last 50 people you talk to? pretty poorly and your parents are right up on that list of sorriness I've had women come to the seminar they talk to their mother 15 times a day now listen to this 15 fucking times a day what possibly can you sit, tell your fucking mother 15 fucking times a day other than neurotic shit what 15 times a day what the fuck you hang out with monkeys, what happens? Your life becomes a fucking circus. Now, with the greatest respect, kids, this is not Barnum and Bailey circus. What I'm here and what Michael, and Michael only does, he doesn't do 100% of what I say, believe me, but he does a lot more than you do. And all my mentees, I've only got one or two mentees that follow my, my, my religion 100%. And guess what? Billionaires, billion with a B. That's all. 
They don't have to sleep with me. They don't have to do, do un, unholy shit to the dogs or cats. But they do every fucking thing I say. And their pay price to action is billions. I'm known as a bionic man because of all the bodily parts I've had replaced. Because I push myself physically. I was being reminded backstage the first time somebody met me is when I almost killed myself racing dune buggies in 1999. And uh, that's when my shoulder and my clavicle and a few other things got busted up. Because I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone. And to get me out of my comfort zone, you've got to do some pushing. Because I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. Having been run over by a buffalo, water buffalo, in Australia, almost killed me. I got up off the ground like Quasimodo, chased it down for two kilometers and killed it. I felt like a truck ran over me. It did. And I continued to push myself. We were in uh, New Zealand, and anyway, 40 to 60 mile an hour gusted winds, and a bunch of kids like you, uh, um, when the wind stops, I'm gonna jump that motherfucker, when that wind stops. Mm -mm. 20 minutes later, we're standing in line. I go give the guy at the front line, here's 100 bucks, the wind just died down, didn't it? Yes, sir. I jump. I come back to the back of the line, there's still, oh, when that fucking wind dies down, I'm gonna jump this cocksucker. They're still waiting in that goddamn line. Because there's never an easy time to make a hard decision. Never. And then, uh, last year, no, earlier this year, one of you says, you know, Dan, there's a thing you might like. What is it? Jumping 108 stories off of a building in Las Vegas. Fuck, that sounds cool. We're there, and I jump. But I shouldn't have jumped because I have two new knees, prosthetic knees, artificial knees. And when you jump, you got to hit both legs at the same time. Unfortunately, I didn't. I hit with my left leg first and fucked it all up. But it's, it's, it's OK now, so don't cry for me. <sighs> Cost is high, not money. Forget everything you ever thought about money. Uh, your days are numbered. Time is very short. Now, and unless you're willing to unfill unfill your key, uh, teacup, I can't fill it. And you can't fill it up with QLA stuff free on my website. 99.9% .9 of all the people that have been helped by my program in 25 years, I've never met. There's some people in this audience that have actually been to my seminar. I'm not pointing them out because I don't want to embarrass them. Because I don't want you mobbing them. Because that's what happens. And the reason why the testimonials on my side don't have last names is because I learned a big lesson 15 years ago, last time I did that. There are people that had to move their houses because people like you were knocking on their fucking door, hounding them like dogs. Some people, we don't even have their faces because you're afraid you're going to do face, facial recognition and hound them down like goddamn dogs. What's difficult for you people, and what I'm saying so far, is a thing called cognitive dissonance. If you've heard a body of information all your life, which is bullshit, and then somebody tells you something else, cognitive dissonance, your, your neurons and your synapses have trouble firing the information back the other way. And that's where most of your sitting right today. You've heard so much crap. You have to scrub your mind clean to make QLA work. 85% of the financial success is due to your personality and your communication skills, not the degrees you have, not what you learned on a podcast. And what have you been told? Just the opposite, right? That's a shite, as they say in Scotland. Carnegie Institute of Technology, school that Andrew Carnegie founded. Now, it's not like we don't have problems all over the world, right? Netherlands is up there, I'm pretty sure. Where is it? Netherlands, 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 Netherlands. Left. Yeah, second from the top. We got problems everywhere, right? If love got the job done, kids, you wouldn't be sitting here. Love does not get the job done. I drove by a college today and yelled, boo! 35 people went to the hospital. 734 needed crisis counseling. 429 needed a safe area or room. Four classes were canceled for a week. This was in Poland. 
They have a safe floor where you can go if life's too hard on you. A whole fucking floor in a big building. I thought I was seeing things. I said, what is this? A, this is a, where you come to, to chill, to meditate if life's too hard on you. Don't, don't you intellectually see how fucked up that is? Then why do you allow it? If your adult child needs a safe space to avoid offensive words, you failed as a fucking parent. It's sad. Now, I'm not going to make you do this exercise, but guys, look at your left hand. Don't show anybody. I don't want you to show anybody. Put your left hand in front of you. And the second from the end finger, this finger, does it look like A, B, or C? Don't tell me. I don't want to embarrass you. Look at, look at your left hand, monkey. I'm, no, I'm talking to you, meathead. Almost everybody in this room has either B or C. I'll bet my testicles on it. And what is A? A is high testosterone levels. Like you had a pair. You know what I'm talking about? This is a scientific truth. Now, I happen to have one more. Needless to say what my hand looks like. I have one more. I have an extra rib in my neck, like Neanderthal man. I have a 13 magic rib. So does my father. So does his father. We're a throwback, one more generation back to cavemen, which shouldn't surprise any of you. I told you about masculinity yesterday, testosterone, handshake level, and all that crap. It's not crap. It's a sad truth, actually. Uh, okay. Now, so far, since I initiated the uh, snowflake test, 95.6% of everybody that's tens of thousands that have taken the test are snowflakes. Now, if somebody came and spit in your wife's face, your daughter's face, you're standing there. Your mother's face. Where I come from, there's only one alternative. Correct. But you know what at least 50% of the answers we get to say? Well, I try to ascertain where, if he was having a bad day. Or I try to ascertain where he's coming from in life. Maybe he came from the body or the ghetto. Are you fucking crazy? The guy just fucking spit in your mother's face, you stupid morons. There's only one fucking alternative. You beat him down through the pavement or die trying. And now the other excuse is, well, I'm afraid of going to jail if I, if I put a whooping on the guy. Well, you couldn't put a whooping on a fucking paper bag, first of all. And that's your excuse. You don't want to go to jail. So now we've got four or five generations of wusses. My kid brother, not my kid brother, my favorite cousin went to jail for stabbing a guy, seven, this is my neighborhood, 17 times because the guy said his girlfriend had a big ass. This is 1961. By the grace of God, he didn't kill the guy. He can't even kill him with 17 stabs, I said, Ronnie, my cousin. Jesus Christ. I knew I should have shot him then. Now, I'm not suggesting you do any of that. But there's a far cry from stabbing somebody 17 times and saying, well, I have to ascertain if the guy's having a bad day or not. How good a day does the asshole have to have for not spitting in your mother's face? The sad thing is most of the guys in here and the women that are married to him, you know what your hussy husband or significant other would do, don't you? Put his tail between his legs like this and walk away. What kind of, I mean, the world's fucked up, guys, gals. If love got the job done, most parents would have had not produced, would have produced high performers, not like you. Okay, this was on TV a few months ago. I don't even know who this woman is. I don't even know who Jennifer Lawrence is, but it makes a point. She's talking to whoever the talk show host was. My friend came back from the bathroom. He was like, "Did you see that guy? She had thrown a drink in a guy's face for saying a smart-ass remark." I've had many drinks thrown in my face, and I'm sure some of the women in this room can probably relate to. So she threw the drink in the guy's face. He went off to the bathroom. He comes back three or four or five minutes later. 
having pissed himself, crying. And she's making fun of it on national television in America. Pissed himself crying. Now, this is why you are the way you are. This is you with a big nose here, see? You got your dreams. You got your relatives. You cannot say relatives without saying lies, by the way. Then you got your own guilt. Then you got your friends. You got pessimists. You got society in general. You got fear. It's no wonder you don't reach your goals. It's no wonder. And that's not for Holland. Just Holland, it's for every place. In China, every place, it's the same. Normally you give up at the relative stage. Maybe you get to the friends. How many of you have heard a friend of yours, they call a friend, tell you, oh God, I mean, you have no chance of getting that done? Yes? Yeah, oh, thank you. Okay, we can all relate to that, myself. When I was a kid, how are you going to do this, Dan? You're, you're in jail all the time. <laughs> well, that's a good question, but uh, I wasn't in jail all the time. That was a slight exaggeration. But the first time I was in the Netherlands 22 years ago, uh, the newspaper said that I had been in jail, incarcerated five times. I had been arrested five times. So Vinica went and corrected him and said, no, no, he was arrested five times. He didn't go in jail five times. But I know what it feels like when that cell closes. First couple times, it's an eerie feeling. And I was sick to my stomach when both my sons went to the same fucking jail that I did. Same cell block for doing crazy shit. Of course, what did my boys do? They didn't do what I told them to do. They do, did what they saw their dad do or what they heard their dad did. I've lived this. On the left is what you've experienced in life to date. 700 books, 200 books, 50 podcasts, right? All the stuff. On the right is when you can connect the dots to experience. And there's no algorithm for experience. There's a few guys like me running around, not many. The reason they don't talk about creating numbers is because nobody's created any, other than myself. There's a guy in America who's still talking about $1.3 million he made 30 years ago, and he shows you how to do it. Of course, $1.3 million 30 years ago is now like $4 million 30 years ago. He hasn't done it 30 years, but he teaches you and he shows you the steps. These eyes have seen stuff you wouldn't believe. Now look at this. From 1945, this was what a He-Man looked like. And now, in Time Magazine, Man of the Year. Jesus Christ, what the fuck happened? That's my dad's generation, fought in two wars. And this is Amsterdam, when I was here in 1951-52. Me personally, leveled. And Rotterdam was more leveled. As a little five, six, seven year old boy, when I was here during World War, a Korean War with my father, he was assigned, he was in charge of the uh, Criminal Investigation Division of the United States Army. Nobody had anything. So somebody in your li life cycle or your gene pool after the war had nothing. Maybe your grandparents, maybe your great grandparents. When I talk to their age, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, Mr. Pena. You feel entitled now. You've led bubble wrap lives. You've all had a bicycle and had trainer wheels. You know, the little wheels that keep you from falling over. And when you take the trainer wheels off, what happens? You fall over on your big melon head, right? And then your mommy or dad, oh, boy, baby, boy, baby. They should have, should have knocked your teeth out and fallen over. And now look at you. Now, I like to say it's not true, but we were so poor we had a possum for a dog. That's what we, in the South, that gets a big laugh. You don't even know what a fucking possum is, but that, that is what I've seen, and you haven't. Germany, I saw the old Berlin. It resonates. I saw my first dead body when I was six years old. And what else resonates? I've been doing crazy shit since I was little. Wrestling with lions when I'm 13. Why am I not, Sally, not, not, not afraid? 
than Sally and I trekking with lions two, three years ago. Tigers, two or three years ago. Yes, people get hurt doing this all the fucking time. They get mauled. That's why most people don't do it. But big, uh, silverback gorillas in Rwanda. Now, the gorillas like Sally, they like blondes. And we've been back twice. And uh, Charlie, who was the, the male, the big male, and the, a big male gorilla had, does two things. Fornicates all day long and eats and sleeps. That's all they do. Not a bad life, when you, you know. And people bring him food so he doesn't have to go worry about generational wealth. And so, but both times we're back there, the, the, the teenage gorillas, or the equivalent thereof, chase Sally around because, you know, for whatever reason, they like blonde hair. Now, this is not a Photoshop. This is a real deal. This is one of you, a seminar mentee who is so ashamed of being a wussy fucking cunt. There's a club in Paris where you go and get beaten 100 lashes a month. He's so ashamed. He's one step away from suicide. He said, don't kill yourself. That's the easy way out. Some of you should trade places with him. That's the real fucking deal. A little Frenchman, he, I mean, he talks like a, a French movie star. Well, Mr. Pena, I don't understand. I get beat every month, and I'm still a cunt. You've never seen this. This is one of the orphanages or, uh, the Sal and I support in Rwanda. This is not a, a Mother Teresa, Sister St. Teresa. Uh, and this was do, doing fine. To, she was going to devote her whole life to these kids. And then after about a year and a half, she gets pregnant. Gee, how did that work out? Well, I don't know how I got pregnant. Well, I, I bet you I know how. So we put up money to build that fucking place. She's going to devote. I, I knew she wasn't going to devote, but I hope spring's eternal. I'm not naive. I'm a lot of things. But maybe she really is going to spend her life with the kids. 11 months later, she, she looks like a, a fucking um, hippopotamus. Then she has a miscarriage. Oh, well, that first one was a mistake. Then she gets pregnant again. I guess the second one wasn't a mistake. And then again, we stopped supporting that place. They're so cute kids, too. Now, at six months old, everybody in this room, except if you had a wet di uh, nappy or diaper, they're laughing. Little kids laugh, right? They're laughing. They're still laughing. At three years old, they're still laughing, right? At three years old, they're laughing. Seven years old, they're laughing. Then something happens. Self-esteem is built the first seven or eight years of life. You can, I can just imagine what happened to you the first seven or eight years. And we're not talking about the physical abuse and that kind of stuff. We're just talking about normal life. Then what happens? Life happens. Your parents happen. And they start directing what their kids do at a seven, eight, nine. They leave the fucking kids alone the first six or seven years because they're smiling and shitting their pants and eating, period. And then they take control of something they know not one bit of what they're doing. Kids are not programmed for success. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Remember, wealth, risk, reward, not. And the kids understand this a lot better than this audience. The kids understand why it's all fucked up. And they want change. And they're willing to make sacrifices to change. You've been in the Hollanders heaven mode too long. Some people will never like me, and I will never give a fuck. You worry about what they say. As I told Brian Rose many years, four years ago, you have no idea how limitless your life becomes vis-a-vis -vis goals when you don't give a shit what people think, say, or whisper about you. You have no idea. The world will not value me until I value myself. And the reason why people don't value you, kids, is because you don't value yourself. Confidence is not they will like me. Confidence is 
I'll be fine if they don't like me. Now, it's safe to say that I've never been worried about what people think of me. That's the truth. That's the truth. That's the truth. These are some of my mentees. That's Taha, one of my Muslim boys in his little roller. That's a pretend roller. That's not like mine. This is a uh, uh, beginner roller, Rolls Royce. Uh, this is one of my, uh, my main brothers, my main man, James Goins. He's in the military. This is from Lithuania. Is it Lithuania? Estonia. Anyway, this is Matt Pelpius, one of the richest kids on the internet. First teenage multimillionaire from five or six years ago. Been to the seminar three times. These are, they turned down 20 million for 5% of their company a couple years ago. They're uh, uh, Australia's Hall of Fame for under 20 or some shit, I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Do they look cocky? You fucking A right they do. They are cocky. They wouldn't piss on your face if it were on fire. They wouldn't dial, is it 999 here or nine when you call the police? Oh, they wouldn't dial it for you. They would step around you rather than put your fire out on your face and piss on you. They're selfish. And I tell you to be more selfish. And your parents should have told you to be selfish. Because you can't be anything unless you love yourself. Now, this is Chris Josopovich, who made seven, eight hundred million dollars at Oxford. He went to Oxford, and the kids don't even ask him what his name is. Why? I'd be all over this guy like a cheap suit. And this is my current phenom, Josh, the teenage multimillionaire. 17, now, he's, he's 20 now. He said, Dan, please don't tell him I'm not 17 anymore. I'm 20 now. I'm 20. 25 millions is all he has. Since he's 18 or 19, look at his testimonial. He's ashamed that he hasn't accomplished more. He's fucking, well, if he's ashamed, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what the fuck should you be? This is where his dream, since he's 10 years old, where he wants to have a house. That's in Hawaii. And that's his house. And what do you live in? I used to actually ask these questions of you, but I, I don't want to know. It just makes me, I don't get depressed, but it might make me depressed. And that's his goddamn house! What the fuck do I have to tell you? He's 20 years old! Christ on my, and it's not internet money. It's bricks and mortar. God bless you, Josh. Oh, and he's Asian. You can't tell he's Korean. He's Korean. He's Korean. So the Koreans say, oh, he doesn't have brown skin. That's why he's successful. That's what they say. He was looking at houses like this. And this is what I tell the kids to do. Go to Oprah's house. That's my house. Go to Will and J Jada Smith's house. And then go to the Dutch houses. They even got rich people here. Hard to find. Not a big, uh, there's not a big list of them. Go to their house. You can go to their houses. That says that they want $42 million. They don't look like $42 million to me. And then they go to this guy's house, $21 million. You go to this house, $19 million. And pretty, you're down to $3 and a half by the time you get to number 41 on the list. Because if you believe, it happens. From the time I made it my, part of my affirmations and my dreams, 17 months passed, and then I moved into the castle. 17. Success is like being pregnant. Everyone says congratulations, but nobody knows how many times you got fucked. I have three million pores in my body. I've been fucked in each one of them at least twice. This, oh, I'm wearing the same suit, actually. No, yeah, same tie, okay. We're born limitless. We have limiting beliefs put on by our parents. Um, we have emotional baggage. What we learn can be unlearned. We stay aware of, uh, we stay aware of our limiting beliefs of others. Get in touch with your emotions. Uh, Michael can help you with that. I'm not too good at that. And you get mentors, as I have mentored him and some of the other people in this room. What the fuck happened? I mean, God almighty. Am I the only one that sees this? There's some slides that are even worse now coming up. I 
I can't get a job because Trump is a racist. And then we bring the Dutch, Dutch in. And I have nothing. You can be gay, trans. I don't give a fuck what you are. This works. This absolutely works. And it has for almost 50 years for myself. And for 25 years, my 25th anniversary was just a few weeks ago. And again, three times with uh, Michael. Maybe my third time will be my lucky charm with him. Seriously, no, he's been successful. Um, as you probably know, his story better than I do. And um, it's not hard. But it's not easy either. If you're willing to make the sacrifices. And most people aren't. And the reason why I resonate so well with kids was I, my, my kids, if our kids were here right now, my daughter would say, Jesus Christ, the world is fucked up, Dad, for another reason, though. Why anybody would want to be raised by you? They, you have no idea what it was to be your child. And I'm, I'm sure I don't. I don't. And my daughter, as I, I think I mentioned yesterday, my dad treats everybody the same, like shit. And I'm hard. And hard works. World-class coaches are hard. We have a, a guy in the um, Hall of um, Fame, uh, my most successful mentees. He says, I haven't been beat this hard since I was uh, the number two guy on the Austrian ski team, arguably one of the best ski teams in the world. And then he blew out his knee, and his coach used to beat him. I mean, physically beat him. Now, I can't get away with that anymore. But the, the, um, most of you needed a beating growing up. You just did. And most of you, your parents, your parents weren't weren't trained to, to produce high-performance kids. You, you and I both know it. You and I both know it. We've had, we've had grandfathers, daughters, granddaughters. And we've had uh, uh, sons uh, um, and fathers in the seminar room. And when you ask the grandfather, I did the best we know how, ask the mother, you don't know what you don't know. Ask the kid, they fucked me up. You don't know what your kids really think about you. I do. I get their emails. Most of your kids are embarrassed by you. In some cases, I'm sorry to say, ashamed of you. That's a sad plight. But it's not too late to give them something to be proud of. It's not too late. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.